please present to you the most beautiful bomb throwers in contemporary architecture, <laughs> Natalie Frankowski and Cruz Garcia. So thanks, Aaron, very much for this um, great presentation. And uh, thank you uh, to David and Gladys Wright House. Oh, <laughs> does this work? I have a light in, in my face, but it's OK. Does this work? No, it's fine. No, I think this is fine. No. It's OK, so I start again. Okay. It's very bright, so I'm a yeah, bit confused. Like yeah. like <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Okay. It's the police. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> No. So yeah, so we are very glad to be here at the David uh, Wright uh, House and Gladys. and Gladys House. Yeah. And uh, I'm Natalie Frankowski, and we I met Cruz uh, Garcia in Brussels, as Aaron was starting to explain, in 2008. And it was an interesting moment for us because we were just out of school. I just graduated from the School of Architecture of Paris La Villette and Cruz graduated from the University of Puerto Rico, and we ended up in Brussels, in Belgium. And uh, two things happened at that time. The first thing is that first we realized that we were quite disappointed with the, let's say, the professional world in which we were entering. We were just out of school, so our last year were like this very exploding, um, fulfilling, moment where we could really manage to try to find what we thought would be our voice in architecture. And when we started to work, of course, like, I mean, there's different types of practices and uh, somehow we didn't really recognize ourselves in this world. And on top of that, 2008 was the beginning of an economical crisis in Europe. So it was quite a strong moment because we were just, we were just, yeah, as I said, just out of school. We were young, and suddenly Europe was just filled with like a lot of pessimism. Everything was slowing down, and yeah, we felt it was there was something else to do about it. So we we found it. Yeah? Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a technical difficulties with the images. Uh -huh. So we found it. We. Walking like a crazy. Yeah, you, you have to point it at this, David. No. No. Because, because the point point. Because it's a lot of images. That's right. So many hundred uh -huh. times. <laughs> oh my God. Five hundred. Huh? Yeah. Should I keep this one? Yeah, maybe I'll click on it. Okay. So, but anyways, I, I just want to keep on my introduction. So. <laughs> So we founded WAY, we, found, we founded our own practice that is called WAY. WAY stands for two different things. WAY stands for what about it, a question, and also for workshop for architecture and intelligentsia. What we liked about the title is like, we thought like, first we thought, how could we start a practice that resembles us? So um, we had to define more what would be a young architecture practice. And to start with a question was very, like for, for us, was very fundamental because we wanted it to be like more like a platform, like a platform where we could collect knowledge, a platform where we could ask questions, a platform where we could provoke. And at also while doing that, we realized that we had also to become our first clients. We had to be the ones that will initiate what we wanted to do. So we started also to experiment with a lot of different tools, as you will see during the presentation. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so that, uh, that's who we are. And so I've, I think, yeah. <laughs> and, um, sorry, where was I? Yeah, so we, we started to, yeah, you will see during the presentation, we started to create our own tools, so our practice is a bit, um, different in the way that we use like collages, we do animations, we write text, we write what we call narrative architecture, we write fictions, we do installation, we use art, we use also drawings, of course, mod models, we do ha handmade collages and all this. But we think that all these tools that we create be 
comes and belongs to the realm of architecture. And I think, yeah, it's time I will let Cruz um, take over. We have, I think, 500 slides or something. Yeah, or something so like that. I, think I hope you don't fall asleep. Yeah. I wanted to walk around because I always like drink too much orange juice and there's a lot of vitamin C there, but I guess I'll stay here. Uh, so, sorry. But I cannot see you, so you can do whatever you want, anyways. Uh, so, as Natalie was saying, um, um, we we have a kind of diverse background, and I just want to say I'm I'm really glad to be here today, uh, and it will be very difficult to live up to what Aaron set up as a as an introduction, uh, uh, because a lot of what he was saying I we like to agree, right? That we believe that it's possible to change the world through what we do, and that's why we do it, because otherwise we wouldn't be doing this, um, and also because uh, we have only two weeks to go in the school which I think that the students are really looking forward to that. Uh, but uh, it, it's been a really like life-transforming life experience. Uh, uh, this is what you see here. So I'm, what I'm going to do, we're going to do this a little bit um, uh, like a um, cadaver exquis, um, where I'm going to show a lot of images, and I'm going to be telling you more or less about, we're going to be telling you a little bit uh, about what, what's the background on the projects and how all the projects come together. So to give you a bit of background, as Natalie was saying, I'm Puerto Rican, she comes from France. Uh, we study in different countries. We met in our first job in Brussels and we hated it. And that's why we wanted to do something different to that. Like, so all the people that you see in the magazine, sometimes it's not, it's not what you think it is. So sometimes you have to create your own practice in order to look what, you, what you're trying to do. Uh, so this, what you see here, is a, is a collage of our, of our our living experience. Uh, um, uh, Puerto Rico's there, Dundee is there in Scotland, France, uh, Brussels where we met, then we moved to Amsterdam, then we moved to, uh, to France again, uh, then we left for China where we lived for seven years. Somehow we end up in Taliesin, uh, which seems like a logical path now somehow. Uh, um, and uh, why I say that is because uh, I, I sort of, never noticed that I studied in a, in a Taliesin building. Uh, so the University of, University of Puerto Rico, where I studied for seven years of my life, uh, all the modern buildings, or most of the modern buildings, were designed by this person that everybody keeps talking about there, but that I really didn't want to pay any attention because I, when everybody tells you to look at something, of course you're going to look in the other direction when you're like me. Uh, he was called Henry Klum, and uh, people that are familiar with Taliesin, they're going to recognize that name. Uh, I mean, his actual name is Heinrich, but Heinrich, but uh, Puerto Ricans cannot pronounce that, so they call him Henry. Uh, so that what you're seeing there is the, the, student, the student center, where I spent a lot of time of my studies. The architecture school was also designed by him, where I studied. Uh, this is the place where they forced me to eat Burger King when I was in the track team. It was not a good idea. Uh, but the idea is that uh, I was always surrounded by this legacy of Taliesin without noticing. Uh, and it's not until I arrive here and then I start seeing all the lectures and symposium, looking at the buildings and start finding all these relationships of things that were really, really close to me, but that I really never noticed uh, until now. So it's like, you know, you have to travel all around the world, literally, you know, we just did a round trip. I went from Puerto Rico to Europe, somehow end up in China and then go to the Pacific and end up in US again uh, to, f to realize that w I was there since the beginning, uh, which is a, a thing is kind of fascinating. Uh, and what I want uh, to talk today, and this is, a, I think this is gonna be a unique lecture, probably it's gonna be, it's the first time we do it. I don't know how many times we're gonna do this, if we're gonna do it again, because I don't know if it's, it's gonna be a, another setting as perfect as, as this for that. But we want to talk about our relationship to Fran Ray Wright. And that uh, may come to a surprise to our students somehow. Um, and, uh, and, and I say that because uh, we, we are always very critical of everything, right? Including everything. Uh, and then we, we also critical to ourselves, which means that sometimes you think something and then at the end you realize that you're not all right. Uh, and we also open to, to, to like shift our perspectives. Um, and, and we want to find this relationships. Uh, it's not in the sense like to say that, yeah, yeah, you know, like a lot of people do and architects say, I love Fran Lloyd Wright, you know, this is my desert concrete or my building looks like a Fran Lloyd Wright building because I, I don't think we have that type of relationship. But there's a lot of things that we share with, with, the, with, with, 
what I guess what our interpretation of what he wanted to do or tried to do or aimed to do or achieved in his career. Uh, and uh, the title you see here, the landscape without qualities, is is more or less the title of the exhibition, and it's something that we've been sort of dealing with. And it's not you shouldn't read it as a as a negative connotation, but what we're trying to aim to do is to explain that in the context of a, of a book from an Austrian author, uh, Robert Musil, that wrote uh, The Man Without Qualities. Uh, and basically he was talking about how, how can you have qualities in a world that changes the way it understands qualities, values, uh, rights, you know, like what makes you good, what makes you human, what makes you beautiful. Uh, and all those things are always being threatened by our our polit political social climate, right? Uh, and and sometimes having the most beautiful things in life are uh, becomes almost like a, an act an act of uh, over overlooking, of not not being aware that we've been surrounded by it. Uh, and and we have a very close relationship to to a legacy of artists and uh, and architects that deal with the idea of is almost an utopian idea of, of architecture and landscape without qualities. Architecture that transcends what people think that is good in the moment, because it's a, it's, it's a universal value that transcends place and time. Uh, so it's very difficult to be trendy or very difficult to be pop or be liked when you're really pursuing some, an ulterior motive that is sublime. Uh, and then we sort of separated the presentation in some ideas that are gonna be popping up with some references or some projects that we think uh, relate somehow to us from Fran Ray Wright. Uh, one of them is the idea of the universalist landscape, and now I'm gonna explain a bit what is that after. And, and the idea of, of form uh, and its relationship with landscape. And there's three main ideas. Like one is form and landscape as two almost autonomous and independent things or subjects and objects. Form as, as landscape, when, when form and landscape become one, uh, and form on the landscape as an act of, of uh, putting something somewhere and framing, and framing a place. Um, uh, and uh, going back to our, one of our um, icons, or, or one of our most revered references is uh, Kasimir Malievich, that was a, a Polish-Russian painter, highly influential in the, in the creation of a modern art and architecture. Um, and it's something really important for us about him, but today we're gonna talk about a bit about that evolution when he went from painting peasants in the landscape and then uh, sort of disappearing in these sort of abstract forms that were trying to break away from, from what you know as an image. Um, and then he made this uh, exhibition in 1915 that is a very critical year in the, in the 20th century. Uh, where he presented for the first time the black square, as you see here in the in the center. You know, usually the cross would be there, right, in the, in an icon in a religious setting. Um, and the black square tried to to start from new. Uh, it was that revolution that Aaron was talking about. You know, how how can we delete what we know and start from scratch? That's why the name of it, of this exhibition was called the last futurist exhibition of art. Zero ten. So it's like after the zero, a ten again. So we have to like delete everything and start from the beginning. Um, after that, uh, Malevich went back due to political pressure, or he maybe he ran out of uh, like the abstract steam that was pushing the suprematist movement, and he started painting landscapes. But they were not the same anymore. They were not peasant women's. It was all these sort of abstractions of what a landscape is, and it was uh, that relationship of these pure geometric objects in the landscape. And this is a, a painting called The Red House uh, from 1932, just uh, one year, I think, before his death. Uh, and then that type of work permeates uh, through the world. Uh, it, and it's that universalist character, that sort of uh, idea of a universal language that, that intrigues us for so long. And I think that also Fran Ray Wright shares, you know, when you look at all those geometric compositions in the, in the walls, in furniture, you know, when you, we look at this house, it's a circle, right? We see all these patterns on the floor, in the roof, in the ceilings, they keep appearing, all these platonic shapes. These are a painting, a watercolor by Pavel Pepperstein, making allusion to that red house. Um, uh, a word by Mladen Stilinovich that is also very politically charged when the, that says, uh, where the drums beat, laws are silent. I mean, it's all for your interpretation. Um, 
a really important work or a work that we like very much by one of our favorite artists, uh, um, Blinky Palermo, um, called Land Landschaft or Landscape from 1966, where he has these two objects uh, making some for, for sort of abstraction of, of what landscape is. Um, or a painting by Cy Twombly, trying to frame between this, within this, it's almost like a squircle, but not really, like that mixture of a circle with a square, uh, and having all this, uh, <laughs> having all this uh, oil paint, and it almost becomes also like a window looking somewhere, right? Uh, or Ilya Kabakov also with that sort of uh, abstraction of the of the landscape, and Ugo Rondinone. Uh, Contemporary artists also working with this idea, but we see all this relationship of form and 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 landscape in 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 art, and it's something that really interests us in the architectural sense. This is uh, one of the first times where artists are trying to work with with space as the work of art, right? So it's the first time that we see the potential of architecture to be the art piece, and it's the creation of what we know as the work of installation. You know, it's great that we have the beautiful flamingos and the fish and the and the blue carpet uh, and, and all that is possible somehow because a hundred years ago these artists start thinking that it's, it's not necessary anymore to look at an object but to look at a surrounding of a, of a, of, of as, as at your environment as the work of art and that's something that is really important for our practice uh, and it's something that we also try to like sort of pass along to our students uh, in a way so this is a proud room that means the project for the affirmation of the new. Uh, and this is the first one of Elisiski. This is uh, our last exhibition we did in Beijing before coming, uh, before leaving for the States and coming to Taliesin. That it was also sort of retaking that idea of the, of the installation or the, or the space as the work of art. Uh, so it has video and sculpture and paintings on the walls. Um, and then I'm gonna start backwards. Usually we show architectural works and then we end up with artwork. So we're gonna start with our artworks that deal with space and, and with the reduction of language and symbols and, and, uh, and geometric forms. And then how that blends in with other strategies and architectural projects. Um, so I'm gonna just f flip quick through these uh, works that integrate poetry and uh, geometric forms and they become landscapes too in space. So for example, this is a poem that we put first because it has a lot of relationship to Wisconsin when we arrive. Uh, somehow it says that, it's the sound of the future, the future, she said, listening to the clicketies of the wind through the cornfields, right? But it's, it's not only the words that are written that makes the poetry, but also the structure that becomes all these geometric forms with paper and become pieces in space. Uh, as installation. And they transform, they change scales. This one is a kind of like a premonition. Uh, I mean, I've never been confronted with a sowato before. And this is a sculpture we've done in 2016 before coming here. So how, how we also we start using text and geometric forms and pieces of history to create all these environments, often in galleries or uh, trying to strip poetry out of its content and leave the structure only. You're gonna see us like that a lot of times, so get used to it. <laughs> yeah, so our artistic selfies. Then they become these uh, large scale installations where we're trying to explore the the possibility of this language that doesn't mean anything and creates an environment or or so to speak some sort of a form of landscape inside a contained space often becomes performative to us we're reading manifestos and ideas behind all these projects even the rabbits are part of the works as you can see here. And that's also something that we try to blur that boundary between art and life and architecture. So it doesn't exist. And that's why probably we are in the studio with the students until three in the morning, mostly. <laughs> so all these are different, often exhibitions we've done in different galleries in Beijing or in Europe.
then there's another thing that uh, relating to this type of project that we find that it, we have in common or that that we can see that's a parallel with Frank Ray right is in the alternative ways of engagement right is a uh, an architect that hated formal education uh, which is ironic uh, but then he creates uh, Taliesin right and is uh, like a, an alternative way to engage with the discipline, how to create and foment and and develop these courses on architecture and and move architecture beyond its constra its constraints by figuring out different ways to do that, not by just going to get a MR or trying to go to a like a certified um, um, institution or to try to get an LEED, you know, uh, AP or something like that, but rather by creating the environment that will allow him to exchange ideas and to push them forward. And that's something that we're really interested in and we always try to, to do by figuring out different methods where we can do that. And mostly, m most of the time, and this also like speaking to our students, is something that you have to figure out for yourself because uh, often doesn't really exist. Everybody has a very different way to see the practice uh, of architecture. Um, and it's something that we always try to do by uh, creating our own publications, um, like uh, What About It, that started in 2011, and it's published like every two years. So every time we feel we have enough content, we publish 100 copies, limited edition, and then we put everything else online so people can see it. And at the beginning, it seems like a kind of like futile attempt to have a discourse and to communicate with architecture, but somehow, if you really put the work there and you, you spend your time and you dedicate to it, it usually comes back, and it comes back like in a really big uh, sequence of events. That, um, so from there, like trying to also develop exhibitions, self-initiated at the beginning, like in 2011, we were trying to do um, our first show, like we commissioned ourselves to do it in the gallery without anybody knowing who the hell we were in Beijing, which we barely knew people there. Um, uh, I mean, if, as you can see now, I can see, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was there somehow, you know, with his hat and his cape. I mean, this is a picture from 2011, which is, a, I was looking through the files like, oh, oh, I see, okay. Um, uh, and then how can we make this, you know, in our little apartment in Beijing? Um, and then uh, put it online, you know, and try to tell people, oh, you know, this is a way architecture team that is having an exhibition in this gallery. And so like, uh, and we were like, we even bought food and everything. It's like, maybe, maybe only five of our friends will come, but it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter. And at the end, it was like, uh, it was very concurred. There was a lot of people there. Uh, and people were really surprised. It's like, what is this? Somebody's doing architecture that is not a shopping mall. And it was like, and, and who are these people? You know, even some like uh, government people came to see if it was like some subversive content that we were showing. And it was not, I mean, at least it was not that obvious. Uh, so it worked out well, right? Uh, so we could show some of the projects we were working outside of uh, China uh, and sort of have some sort of dialogue. And then after that, we start making more exhibitions like uh, Pure Hardcore. I'll show you what this project is about, but I'll first show you the exhibition in 2014 where we took a factory, an old factory building in Beijing as part of Beijing Design Week, and we presented our manifesto of form in architecture. So it was the first time we were showing our, pa our painting work together with the collages we were making. And also it was a lot of people coming and asking questions about all these ideas. So there was a hunger in the air about, for this course that it was not so common. There, was, there, were, there are no spaces in Beijing for this type of activity. You know? Being here, sometimes you take for granted. You, know, you go to storefront in New York or you go to university, you have lectures, right? And you have exchange with people. But that, that doesn't necessarily happen by itself. Sometimes you really have to force your way into it. Um, especially if you like to speak a lot like me. Then some years after, we, we did Utopia Room in, in a space that we were gonna turn into a gallery, but uh, I mean, we left, so the project's still pending. Uh, so we took this de derelict room and then filled it with our collages. Um, tried to get the people to engage with a space that is really run down by putting all these pictures of subversive futurist projects. Um, And then we start getting invited for, for doing exhibitions around the world. Like uh, we did the Room of Manifestos the same year in the uh, Kunstwerke Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, where we showed some of our work, like video mixed with, with uh, publications, mixed with architectural models. 
and it was like a lot of people and everybody was really excited which it was kind of weird because in Berlin there's an event every like two hours or something like that but apparently there's a lot of thirst for it and it's, uh, it's very interesting because uh, you're working literally alone at home uh, in our apartment for seven seven years uh, I mean during that period we also collaborate, collaborated with other architects and we work in around like 22 museum projects some built some not built uh, but most of them we never show them I mean we never show any of those projects because uh, they're not really ours we work in collaboration with other people we always have this sort of idea that we were really aiming to have our own practice because uh, we believe in something and we should pursue it so that's why I mean all these things take a lot of time but then with time the the projects start getting their a life on their of their own uh, and you're able to discuss those ideas and we have like the opportunity to be one of the three China representatives, I mean, it's a very polemic thing to do, but the curator for the first Chicago Biennale invited us to go to, to Chicago. Uh, and in China, all the media was really angry and the architects because uh, how dare you pick up two non-Chinese architects. But anyways, uh, we had the opportunity to go there and then uh, they told us, oh, you have these dimensions on the, on the gallery, so you can make whatever you want. It was like, oh, look at the size of that wall. And then we made this uh, sort of uh, collage. It was called the Wall of Manifestos without realizing that it was going to be in the main exhibition hall. So when we arrived there, late, because we missed a flight, again, uh, everybody was telling us, ah, we really like your installation. We were like, really? Where is it? Up there. And when we go, it was this huge room. It was a really nice surprise to fly all over around the world and then see all your pieces there uh, that you've been working on for like seven years alone in, uh, in a technical basement. I mean, it was not a basement, but it's everything in Beijing is a bit like a basement. And then have the opportunity to have that dialogue with a bigger public, a broader public. That, that's what always you're aiming for. And then now, uh, when we go, after we finish here, we go to Lisboa, where they have an exhibition on the 500th year anniversary of Utopia. And then our piece also became that sort of icon of the exhibition. Because it was a, I'm going to explain to you after when you see the, the image, but it's a, it's a piece about uh, 100 years of utopian efforts of architects. So e even the media in Portuguese is all like talking about it, which is kind of interesting. And then have opportunities to show in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, or where we met Aaron in Shenzhen, uh, which is a, this is a, f a funny story. Um, because uh, it's the first time we meet Aaron in person. We saw him in Chicago when he walked to, our, to the wall, but we didn't know him. So he's like, ah, that's Aaron Besky. He's the one that was making fun of us in that article he wrote, you remember? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show you the article after. It's a, f it's a, it's a funny development of events. Um, but Aaron was creating the exhibition in Shenzhen. And then we were like a last call because somebody, one of those uh, big architects saw our work that we were going there for something else. They're like, oh, you should come and talk about our work. And we were like, talk about your work? Okay. And then we went there and we started making fun of them. And they sort of took it in lighthearted model because, I mean, they're very rich and powerful anyways. And we were like, Too, whatever, whatever. But it was a very interesting debate. Uh, and Aaron was there and he told us about this school where he just became dean and people live in the desk. And we were like, sounds like hippies. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then Aaron sent us an email after saying like, ah, you know, we have a, we have a lecture. You can come and do a lecture here. We were like, ah, yeah, great. Sounds great. We, and then after he sent another email saying like, would you like to come to teach? And we were like, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but then we like trusted the process, let's say. And we, I, I barely, I basically didn't Google at all what Taliesin was on purpose because I was afraid that I was not going to go too much. Uh, because uh, every time I Google, uh, crazy stories appear on the internet. You know how the internet is. So I was like, I'm eh, not sure about this. So we skipped the searching part and we just trusted our instincts, which we are not regretting yet. There's two more weeks to go, so don't let me down. Uh, which brings us to another project we've been developing. Uh, uh, when we were based in Beijing, there was a very big problem where we couldn't really relate to the art circles there because everybody that was there was looking for Chinese artists that look Chinese, making art that look Chinese. And we don't fit any of that criteria. Um, and then there was like very, very few places that were willing to show Chinese artists together with non-Chinese artists. Uh, and all the art, art circles in Beijing, I don't know if you, some of you have been in Beijing, I think some of you have been. Uh, 
in Beijing, the art circles are literally in a circle. So there's an, a district where all the artists live and they show their art there. So it doesn't really mix with society. So it's a very bizarre thing. It's very interesting and very alive, but it's very different to anything you've ever seen. Uh, and we live in the center of the city and we thought we had that, this idea after doing a competition in Moscow that I'm going to show you after of creating uh, an art space that was everything but what they had there. So it, of course, we, we didn't have any money. So we just rented a very small space in the street in a rundown area that was really smelly because there was a dumpster next to it. Uh, and then we decided to open a gallery. And then we said, so we're going to make a show. The first show is going to be our work. And if people don't come, we just change it into an architectural office. So then we don't waste any, anything, right? So we made the first show, and then it was total success. Everybody loved it. So then we started making shows. And then in the two years and a half that we were there, we did, in total, in the gallery and other galleries that we got invited after, we did a total of around 100-something exhibitions with like 200 artists from all around the world. So it was very successful, and it was very quick. Uh, Every year in Beijing feels like seven years somewhere else. So that's why the amount of exhibitions. So the idea is that all the, every exhibition there had the capacity to change the environment. We invited filmmakers, artists from six different continents, including really famous and known Chinese art, artists that were willing to work with the project because it was so different to everything they've seen. And it was a very small space where we can read manifestos and show works of uh, 180 square feet. So that's pretty small. And that's how it feels when you're in a small space. So it was always like this. It's like packed in every opening. And everybody's talking about art. Everybody's discussing, discovering new artists. And it was very popular. Uh, and it also opened a lot of doors for us uh, in, in ways where we couldn't have foreseen at that moment. Um, we had the opportunity to create discourses and debates about art that never happened there. So all the artists are really were really excited to do that. Uh, we show works of designers, architects, fashion designers together. Famous, young, not so famous, first show of some people, al always group shows. Um, except once that we did 35 solo shows in 35 days. And that was very tiring, but it was a great, great experience. This is one of the solo shows where some people were making installations in the space. Um, these are some pictures of those 35 shows in 35 days. So every day we had to release a press release do interviews with the media, send the posters, open the show, close the show, clean the gallery, install again, and start all over. 35 days. In the meanwhile, we had to travel to Europe to do lectures, send everything online, come back, finish, collapse. And then a lot of the shows, we met friends and pets that came flying to us, like our chicken, Chickpea. She appeared one day, as you can see here, came flying to an exhibition, and then she became our pet. This, uh, then we start doing exhibitions in bigger institutions. We were getting invited, and then we were bringing Russian artists and discussing ideas about architecture and the environment and landscape that we always wanted to pursue, but we never had the chance to do it because of the space where we were. So we started expanding in all these spaces. So we were creating the show, showing us artists, being the PR management, and doing the design, and doing everything together, designing the exhibition, and having fun, and discovering, and having dialogue with and pushing the discourse of contemporary art and architecture. Discussing topics we're really interested in, like uh, this was the, the 100 year anniversary of Zero 010, the exhibition of, uh, where Malevi showed his black square. This was an exhibition called Hypertext, about the reduction of language in the age of the internet, and how that manifests through forms. We have like video artists, photographers, architects, poets, all working together. And that's something that I, I think also it relates somehow to, to the legacy of this place. So it's not just architects there and designers there and landscape architects there, but everything together somehow. This is a work by um, artist based in Mexico City, the one that said good as gold. And this one is, uh, says in the stone is a very heavy marble stone that say the dream is over. It's from a Mongolian artist. It's a really powerful piece. And all these things, we discover them because we're looking for all these artists and see how the works can relate uh, in, the, in the role of curator, let's say. And even like started curating shows in our apartment as part of the legacy of Beijing, because in Beijing, there were no art spaces. They were, they were forbidden for a long time until the 90s. And people, all the artists used to show art in their apartments. That was the way to show art there because police would come and like beat you in the head. 
so then we did one and it also a lot of people thought it was a gallery which was a problem because a lot of people that we didn't know came but it was fine because at the end it was a very interesting also debate about art and then it started giving a lot, a lot of exposure to us for reasons that we never expected for fashion architecture art creating and it was all these things all these doors opening just because we wanted to do something it was not really aiming for that but we realized also that that media had a power and that we we could use that to generate more projects and to bring more people together this is our apartment in beijing that was part of the exhibition i mean this is our bedroom that's side we sleep with all these shapes so now you will understand us better <laughs> And that's Blinky and Pasha, that are also part of the apartment. They're still there. We're paying rent for three rabbits. <laughs> that's Ponyo. <laughs> and also, like uh, how all these bodies and uh, and 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 objects occupy a same space or a same landscape is also very important. These are apartment in uh, Taliesin that also has been turning into. It's like chick pox, you know, chicken pox just spreads all over, whatever we go, starts growing up and becoming part of our environment. And then going to uh, the landscape on the, uh, objects in the landscape or forms in the landscape, there's this project by Ro Rose, uh, the Rose Possum House in 1938 and 39 that also really strike to us. And there's maybe a lot of people don't know about that, even scholars of Frank Lloyd Wright, because uh, there's somebody we're really interested that is not very famous. That is the person that received Frank Lloyd Wright when he was in Russia. And it's a student of Kasimir Malevich called Lazar Hidekel. And the files are in New York that we're going to see them soon because the daughter-in-law has all the archives of the collection. So it was a per it was, they were really following what Frank Roy was doing, but also they were very contemporaries of him. So while he was making all these houses, like, I mean, these shots are beautiful and they're really powerful too. Um, and it brings us to, to these projects of Hidekel in the 20s, 1922, 1923. Uh, as you can see in this sketch, uh, for these like horizontal volumes that are flying in the air, um, or aerial cities, how he called them, or these sketches that are somehow they, they, they are strikingly similar to something we've seen, uh, and they have a very close relationship. Uh, he was the only practicing suprematist architect that didn't got kicked out by Stalin. Uh, I mean, and the daughter of Stalin also live in, uh, in Taliesin. I mean, all these links are there. They're pretty alive, and hopefully we can explore them after in the future. Um, uh, and then it's, it's something that we discovered one day, and then we were Googling, and we, re we realized that it was really difficult to Google this person, which means that there was a lot of potential there. If you cannot Google something, that's what you should do. You should work on that, because it means that people have done it, haven't done it yet. Uh, so we found these watercolors that we found that were so radical and contemporary that we wanted to bring them back to life. So we started working with them, trying to make them real again by working just with the image. And then with this, we start writing text that can sort of bring this architecture back to life. Like we saw this watercolor also and we brought it back to life just with simple Photoshop skills. And then going back again to our trip, uh, from migration in uh, Taliesin, it, it was like so so strikingly beautiful, but not for what you expect. People usually talk about architecture, but what caught our attention was the these objects in the landscape, right? That we're we're traveling around. The, these are pictures we took at like 95 miles per hour in the car. <laughs> we were traveling with Aaron. Oh, well, sorry, like 75, 10 only 10 above the speed limit, <laughs> uh, and we were documenting all these objects appearing, mostly industrial objects or discarded houses in the landscape. And they resemble a lot to projects that we've always been dreaming about somehow that we haven't been confronted with before. We had the opportunity to discover them in that trip from, from Wisconsin to from Spring Green to, to Scottsdale to, to Taliesin West. And it's that power of the landscape uh, that is somehow enhanced by these objects that are put there somehow. Or at least that's how we see it in a very romantic way. This is a romantic lecture if you haven't noticed yet. <laughs> and again, that red house of Malevich keeps appearing wherever we look. 
And then uh, Aaron wrote a really nice piece on it. You can look at it in Architect. Uh, on the road trip through the American great spaces, and it starts. Why Cruz Garcia says from the back seat, you know, and then you can imagine how the 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 go the the article will go. Uh, and then and what we we we're showing this is because it relates to some projects we've been working on on this what we call architectures without qualities, uh, where we put these icons in a future where architecture has nothing to solve. It's like the perfect utopia. Uh, so you wonder if people are still there. It's like architecture has nothing to address, right? So it's just a formal exercise. And there are always these objects appearing in the landscape, but there's never evidence of people there. And it's always dreaming about that possibility. Is there architecture without us? And uh, going back to, to, to the work we're doing uh, with our students, uh, uh, to in when we were doing a class for um, architectural representation or communicate design, as they call it, we wanted to explore that idea of how, how free can you be when you're dealing with these shapes and you don't imagine any program with it. So in order to, to, to teach or like to see, discover how to draw and represent, we, we gave them a simple task to imagine an object as with a reference and have a, a an archetype, like a function, an, arch uh, an architecton like the ones I show, or a pool, or an aviary, and take a geometric shape and try to explore it by inserting it in the landscape without any preconception, without any sort of uh, ethical pursuit. And these are the projects that they came up with that I find that they're quite beautiful. And they also carry that sort of essence of, of those objects being uh, collocated in the landscape. And the, they're first year students, so I think it's something that is quite commendable. They were making the objects in concrete the drawing. So they're learning how to make images and to draw while exploring these ideas with very simple compositions. And using that vocabulary that we have as architects to communicate those very simple ideas. That's like Nelson with the pool. The drawing from the pool inside or the pool inserted in the landscape. Uh, the courtyard of, uh, of Michael. The concrete model. Connor's cube, the constructing the cube and inserting it in the in the mountains in the in Talias in West, or figuring out how to draw it by hand. So it's always this. They don't know yet, but that it, it it all relates. It has this relationship of how can you free yourself and and experiment with those uh, that legacy of pure forms, uh, the Abiary by Lorraine. Xin Xuan and the Architecton. It, so they had to insert it in Wisconsin and then we traveled to to um to Taliesin West and insert it in the in the desert. And figuring out how to make these drawings too. So how to learn how to draw while thinking about all these things in the back of the head. The floating building of Abraham. Then we made exhibitions with that. That is also a very important part for us. How, how can you create something and communicate to a community? So we took it out of the school and we presented it in the white schoolhouse in, uh, in, uh, in Spring Green. And it was open to the public so the students could sort of have a, a dialogue and a discourse with, the, with people and the community. Uh, the projects of our second year students, uh, Tower of Trina, August Bridge City over Phoenix. and uh, Richard's exploration of the grid. It's Minerva and Floyd. And then after they did a beautiful reading on, on the manifesto that I think it also it was something that also captures that essence of how can you create platforms to, to, to keep developing this course on architecture. So they read their manifestos and showed their images. I think it, it was a, sort of performance, as you can see in the stage, you know, you've seen the, uh, the buildings in a, trying to explore also the potentials of the buildings to, to create that sort of scenography for the projects. And then also something we've been, we've been working really hard with our, with our students is that we made maybe like the first magazine in the history of the school for, uh, that made by, with the students in a way, more or less, uh, or at least aiming to like address not what Taliesin does, but what architecture does in a general sense. Um, it's called Wash Magazine, and they shows the name, uh, and it has uh, something to do with 
I think with Taliesin, it's kind of easy to understand. Uh, and they had to do everything for the magazine, like from figuring out what to show to how to write it to how the design is going to be, having like very long conversations about it or fights over it, and try to find a topic. So they made, on Utopia is the wrong word, on the 500 year anniversary of Utopia, that was last year. Um, and again, going back to that idea of the land <coughs> with Utopia and having all these debates. And then trying to figure out also what to bring there, like architects from all around the world and how to bring them there uh, to Taliesin. So we always keep our eyes open for everything that is happening around us. Because it's a little bit difficult sometimes to look beyond when you're surrounded by so much beauty in the immediacy. But how can we expand that outside of our walls? <coughs> This is a work by a South African architect, Wolf Architects, Bas Prinsen in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Philippe Jordan, Simona Rota. Then there is a, another work that also relates somehow to this idea of the utopian project, like Brodaker City, uh, that I think that is maybe one of the most important, wor important works of, uh, of of ideal planning in, 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 in this side of the world. Um, and how can we use that also as a, as a tool to produce knowledge? And that's something that we've been looking forward. And it's a, that's why we created this sort of a panorama of 100 years of, a, of ideal cities. That it starts with the 1900s, with Ebenezer Howard, Le Corbusier, Tatlin in the back, you know, up here from the right with his onion cars, flying cars nuclear bomb in the world war and then in time you start seeing how all these shapes relate to each other somehow by putting them all together in a in one even landscape <coughs> having all the dates there <coughs> and then that brought us to a second project that is a um, uh, what we call and this nobody has been able to disclaim it yet i'm waiting for that moment is the first manifesto in the history of architecture about pure form nobody has done it before top that so what we were claiming is that in 1966, uh, it was the, the last manifesto of the 20th century by, by Robert Venturi, that it was when postmodernism started. Uh, thank to God I was not alive in that, in that period. So I was born long time, postmodernism was in decline already. Uh, but the idea is that that idea of declaring intentions about architecture has been diluted somehow. So architects have become very aware of their uh, sort of Machiavellic role in society and they try to be good with everybody. So they often don't talk about what they want to do. Uh, they just want to work with the tyrants and with the Democrats and with everybody, you know, right? So it's, a, it's a, like a free for all. And that's something that we really stand against uh, as anybody that knows us can tell. Uh, <clears throat> and we, th we feel that by declaring your intentions, you can sort of address architecture in a full frontal way, even if you're not able to deliver, but at least it, it keeps your path clear. Uh, so then we started looking at history, and we realized that modernism also has its manifestos. For example, crime and ornament, Adolf Loss in 1908, he was talking about how to get rid. He was pretty much telling you what not to do, that is to make ornament. And then Le Corbusier was giving you five points, you know, the pilote, the horizontal window, the garden roof, the free facade, and the free plan. That is basically a, a, a kit of what you should do in order to make modern architecture. And uh, it sort of takes this form with the Villa Sawa. You see the five points there somehow. Uh, and then we, we came up with this sort of half humorous theory of something hardcore, which means, I don't know what you're thinking about hardcore, but hardcore means the, something in its more, most pure or basic form, which is pure geometry in this case. Uh, and this, uh, now we're going back to Aaron, I don't know if he remembers when he wrote this long time ago. In 2012, he wrote this article. Before we even make the full theory, we start publishing online and whatever. And Aaron wrote this paper called Hardcoreism Remains Soft. I was like, whoa. I was like, well, at least Aaron Besky is reading us, we told ourselves. But he was saying that uh, there's something circling the internet with less, uh, less popularity than the newest cat video, which is true. You can never beat cat videos. <laughs> but it's also like funny because uh, it somehow make, made us rethink what we were doing. Is like, ah, I think that we may not be able to deliver this as hard as we wanted. So we just decided to dedicate a full book theory, theory book to that, to that manifesto. Uh, the other one in the right is uh, Aaron years later praising us, saying like, ah, oh, you know, they're making great images. It's like, okay, so at least it was a change. So I'm, I'm expecting that when we leave, Aaron is gonna write something like the first one again, and then maybe in 20 years he's gonna go again and tell us, okay, you're not so bad anymore. 
Um, so going back to Malevich, you know, we were, we were thinking, if it's possible to do this with R, to reduce R to pure geometric form, is it possible with architecture? You know, can we do that with all the forms that are popping up in the internet? Can, can, can we sort of understand some sort of logic behind all this mass porn production of forms? Uh, and then we, we start looking at architecture, right? And looking at all these iconic buildings around our neighborhood in Beijing, like CCTV, you know, it's like, it looks so unique, you know. Uh, but then 10 years before that, somebody has done something kind of similar. And then we realized that it was not only that tower where that has happened. But then we start seeing all these buildings with shapes that looks like letters. You know, this one is in Belgium, in case you don't know where it's located. And this one is the Walter Tower, so it has the W of the owner. Uh, or buildings that, like MBRDB, um, um, Ministry of Agriculture, that is this model that looks kind of strikingly like a, like a Swiss cheese. And then uh, Seji Manichi Sawa in Lausanne. And then we, we start imagining, is it possible to make a catalog of these forms? Is it the, can, can we make something with this that becomes an architectural theory? Uh, I mean, and then we start finding all these landscapes, and I'm going to try to pronounce it well, and I'm not going to manage, but uh, Kaspar David Friedrich, almost, okay. Uh, it's a German painter that paints landscapes. Uh, and they always have this sort of dichotomy between natural and, and, and man-made, and that's something that really strikes us. And we wanted to explore that dichotomy or that dialectic between natural uh, two, two opposites. And then we start making collages with these landscapes uh, about buildings that want to be iconic, but that when you put them together, they become like a category of something, like the looping skyscraper or the stacking boxes. So we start putting funny names to them. So it's like a form of making people aware that this is happening. We're not trying to pass any judgment. It's not that this is good or this is bad, but rather that we should look at this. There's a lot of potential here, maybe to teach, to practice, to understand the implications of these uh, you know, buildings with letters from the alphabet, like the first three OMA, you know, done by OMA, in case you didn't know who made them. Other buildings with other letters of the alphabet, buildings with the tower and the box, the horizontal condensers, towers with linked bridges, the architectons, you know, Malevich, SOM, Javier de Hater, OMA, speleotems or mineral formations. And we started like playing with these forms in order to create images that are not just cute, you know, to click on them, but also they're trying to deliver content and theory about architecture. So that's something that's really important to us. Every image has some sort of political role, right? So it wants to deliver a message and have some power. Inverted pyramids. And then we realize that maybe this is not so contemporary. Maybe we should write a theory about the history of form in architecture. And people were, every time we presented this in universities around the world, people were really angry, saying, ah, you want us to do form only? Said, no, no, I'm not saying that. You know, I'm just trying to like, show you that this happens. It's evidence. No, it's not true. OK, so it's not true. So we're going to prove you that it has always been like that. So then we went back in time. We started reading uh, Car uh, Carl Jung, like a archetypes of the collective unconscious. And he talks about this, how these archetypes appear in the minds and in the works of people independently of place and time. They have always been there with us. So we wanted to prove how this happens in architecture. And then we, we created the, the real first theory of pure hardcoreism. That is pure hardcoreism. Uh, and then we start making all these collages about how we always been obsessed with pure form in art, in, in uh, if you look at religious works, if you look at the work of Franley Wright, in the work of Plato, in the work of Malevich, you know, there's always these triangle circles appearing. Walter Di Maria, Sengai Gibbon, completely unrelated. One is a, is a monk, a Buddhist monk. The other one is an American artist, contemporary artist. Michael Hazer, David Nash. And then we started going back in time, you know, Mecca, Inkaba, um, Akaba in Mecca, sorry, the Cenotaph of Newton, the Pyramids in Giza, then more contemporary, uh, Guerini, uh, Boulet, Piranesi, more contemporary with uh, Aldo Rossi, Epcot Center, uh, Sir Norman Foster in Astana, in Kazakhstan, even more contemporary, you know, and with this, it's like, if you're denying it, we, and we're not saying that all architecture is obsessed with form, but for the architecture that is, this is the manifesto. So it was uh, that I idea that there's a way to make theory, even if it has been happening for ages. 
and then we made the, the third theory that was like post-ideological icons, and it's how form can be recycled and the ideology is stripped. So we have highly ideological icons at the beginning, and then buildings that resemble them, but they have a completely different program. So these ones are made during the revolution, after it's just the headquarters of Gazprom, or buildings of the revolution, a museum in, in, in Nanjing by Stephen Hall, buildings of the met Japanese metabolist, a building in Korea by JDS, 30, 60 years after. And then we designed a book that we published in London, and we made uh, all the like images that are gonna support it, like the Sphere City, the Pyramid City, the Cube City. Made the book, designed the book, following a square shape, of course. Then the book was translated in German by uh, by Arsch Plus, that is like one of the most important German magazines for their 40th year anniversary. And they sort of put a bunch of relatively young practices that practice under this rubric of formalism, including us somehow. Um, and it was uh, in German, it was uh, hardcore architecture, as you can see there, it's kind of funny. We didn't know that we we're gonna make it in the cover and make it the whole issue. They just asked us for the content and they didn't told us. Um, then uh, another type of project that we've been working on is, and uh, we've also been teaching to our students, is how can we use this type of images, as you saw, to make provocations about architecture and tell stories about them. You know, learning from the radical architectures of the 70s and 60s. So the, for this we use a theory of, of what Peter Sloterdijk calls critique of cynical reason. And just to make the story short, it's like Diogenes, as you can see here, uh, Diogenes uh, was a, provo a provocator, an intellectual provocator. He used to walk during the day with a lantern looking for an honest man. So that's what we wanted to do with this type of architecture. Uh, that it was how to make stories that can spark some type of criticism uh, about the discipline. For, for example, for the first one, we saw Andrei Tarkovsky's stalker, and we stole his three main characters. They used to be a writer, a professor, and a scientist. Uh, no, a, a writer and a professor and a stalker that were like looking for a, a fantastic place uh, with powers. And we, we changed them and we made them into three architects, into Wall Stalker. And these three architects go from a city of icons, they're saturated by power and iconography, and they try to run away, looking for the essence of architecture. So there's uh, animations that we made with this, some collages, in order to tell a story about three architects trying to find the essence of architecture in a world, in a world of icons. And they realize when they get there, finally, to that mysterious wall, mysterious wall, uh, they're not able to see what essence is. So they go blind in the second animation. And at the end, they get seduced again by these powerful shapes without noticing that they were trapped in George Orwell's, George Orwell's world of 1984. Following the icon and the money end up there. And then uh, now it has become, uh, and again, that was done like several years ago, and now it's, people have been writing about it for unknown reasons. Another project that has like some political connotations and has to do with where I come from in Puerto Rico, where right now we've been stripped of our the, the last money we had uh, by Wall Street. Uh, we imagine a world where uh, the land is bought by Wall Street and is expropriated of its people and is used only for architecture. So every architecture serves a purpose. Uh, they stole some secret projects from the Russian avant-garde in the 20s, but they never had the technology to Im implement it, but now they have it. And then they created these six buildings and these are the drawings for them. This is the aviary where they steal colorful parrots uh, to tell them all the secrets. So they start taking all the parrots from people and they start putting them in these sort of concentration camps of colorful parrots. Or the uh, like flying fortresses or prisons that circle the beaches, the beautiful beaches. Usually you see utopias and they are always in cold places that are kind of nasty. These are like uh, utopias in the tropics. This is the amphibian fortress that is monitoring the, f the rainforests or the antennas that communicate with the main main uh, investors. And the towers that send the messages. 
and a concentration camp from iconography of, uh, of politics. And then uh, they are now moving to architecture, and these are some other projects that we've been doing, uh, where architecture is also explores this continuous landscape uh, that again has some really close relationship to where we're standing here today. Um, uh, this is a project we did in Russia, and I, I, I put this picture here because this is the most I had to t we, t we have to take from that. That is a if you see up there, it was the 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 people that organized the competition. Uh, they were they took us to this museum to see an exhibition of Elisiski with Ilya Kabakov, and they took this picture of us looking at that. But up there, you can see what has become our motto, pretty much our philosophy. That is victory, victory over the everyday. Every day seems like a year, so you have to always keep on reminding yourself that it's a fight. That is worth fighting. So it's a competition that we got the opportunity to finish in the finalist round for the biggest museum of contemporary art in Moscow. Um, and it was gonna be the site. What we wanted to do it was to bring that sort of idea of bringing society and the arts together, like this uh, ballet in Petrograd in uh, 1922. Like bring art to the masses. And the manifesto of the building was pretty much that idea. How can we bring art to the masses? Um, the the site of the project was it was gonna be the first major museum in Moscow outside of the center, so it was in this old airport. And the airport has the biggest shopping mall in Europe, in the pointer working up here, in the upper part of the airport of the landing strip. That's gonna be where the biggest shopping mall in Europe is gonna be. Uh, so the project consisted of making a museum in front of that shopping mall. And uh, most of the architects that were in the competition proposed to make a wall so they could stop the people from coming, you know, to, from the shopping mall to the to the to the museum. What we wanted to do was to create a continuous surface where people can see art without paying, without um, without having to stop what they were gonna do in the day. How to bring art to the people? These are some of the drawings. So the idea is that all the public programs were in the ground level in open volumes, like the, mus the music hall, the lecture hall, the library, uh, and the galleries were in the second level, uh, second, third, and fourth, with volumes that connect them like bridges. These are the galleries. The structure was kind of simple. Bridge structure. This is a model of the, of the project. And the idea is that, as you can see, the volumes are open in the ground level, and people can circulate through the buildings without having to pay for it. And they can participate with the open with the open spaces, the ateliers, the the workshops. Uh, it was a forty six thousand uh, half a million square feet basically project. That was our first big uh, paid project, let's say. Um, and pretty much we were competing against three Russian offices and 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 six well some of them Pritzker prizes. So we were of course the youngest ones. Uh, and we were like the one that nobody knew really because everybody else had some really big reputation and there were these two guys from Beijing but they were not Chinese so everybody was very confused about that. <coughs> the idea is that museum can become this performance space where people are dealing with art in, uh, in, in a variety of ways. With the terraces, in the open spaces, with ateliers for artists, uh, in the library, the children's center. The, now in the galleries and how the galleries relate to the open spaces outside of the building. How the spaces are flexible where you can have different types of exhibition. And then after doing that project and losing, it was a very low point for us. It was a very tough thing to lose. We knew that we were not going to win because it was almost impossible to win a competition in Russia for, I think, uh, we thought for us, even if we had made it to the second round. Uh, it, it was supposed to be a blind competition, so they just choose the project, but then they, they wanted to see the people. And then you have Nieto Sovehan or Alejandro Rabena there, and then we are like the two unknowns that are not Russian. So it was a little bit tough. Uh, it was very tough to swallow, so it was a very sad winter we had, but that's when we opened Intelligentsia after that. And then we started thinking about this idea of failure. Uh, and so another relationship to a project of Fran Lloyd Wright is that idea of the spiral in endless growth. How can something keep, something keep growing? Like the building where we are right now, the David and, G and Gladys Wright House. And it's something also that you see in the Guggenheim. It's that idea of something always spiraling upwards.
and it translated to the first project we did after lo losing the competition in Russia. That is the, the Palace of Failed Optimism. Uh, and it's a museum for failed projects, basically. And it's a tower that is always spiraling upwards, where you put projects that fail. It's always growing. There's always projects there to be shown. And then after that, coming back to China, we got invited to do a competition for a museum in Suzhou. That is a museum that we call Museum of Gardens. Most of the museums in China have no program, so we had to come up with a program. So we wanted to have this open, again, this idea of the open, the continuous landscape and in the project. How can we bring the garden in the galleries and have a promenade that is free so people can circulate through the building and have the galleries at the same time relating to the open spaces. So sometimes the gardens are inside of the building and you access them from the outside and you have this dialectic of nature and art and architecture at the same time. And another project we've been working for almost seven years. And hopefully we're going to build in the next 30, let's say, because uh, politics in Puerto Rico take a long time. Uh, but it's a, one of our favorite projects that we like to work in is a sports school. Uh, and again, this idea of continuous landscape relates the sports arena with the classrooms, a boarding school, a public school, boarding school. Uh, this is a model of the picture. So you always have the 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 outdoor spaces or the sports sports facilities in direct contact with living and studying or you have the the students in the second level going to the classroom the boxing gyms football park the library at the same time you can see everything in the other side the classrooms so it's this disappearance of boundaries between the programs and another project we got a commission in beijing to study it was a how a create a an institute for research of urbanism in the center of the city. And we imagine, again, this continuous surface where we can have all the, all the programs, like education program, exhibition program, performance program together in all these surfaces that, could, that are continuous and somehow relate to each other, the exhibition space. You have a, a spaces of total creation where everybody can learn from each other. And another project that is also in... Uh, in construction, but that I don't know if we have the opportunity to see it, is a Leave Creators Offices. That is a, an office for, for an artist, an artist. so it's almost like an atelier or a working space for an artist, that also has that idea of connecting the spaces. So it's not a conventional office space, but it's a space that tries to challenge the, the dictatorship of the plan, where you have like a slab on top of a slab, but creating all these spaces that relate to each other, where you can have all these big installations happening inside. And then to close, two of our favorite projects that we do with the uh, children is the Palace of Megaliths. Uh, and that's really important for us. We're always trying to not only teach to like, graduate students or university students, but also to try to bring the ideas and communicate them to smaller audiences. How can you talk about architecture and the environment and your power to change it to, to kids, for example? This is a project we did in Shenyang in the north of China with 200, 200 styrofoam cubes. Uh, where kids could create their own environment for seven days. I mean, those are us, but these are the kids. So everybody becomes aware of this capacity you have to transform the environment. And it was, a, you can tell how kids were really happy to do this. It was a really like liberating experience. And also very, it was a very powerful learning experience for us too. Because it, it helps you to understand how basic things can be. We have kids there that the parents have to drag them outside of the, of the space that they didn't want to leave. And then to close is our... Uh, if you want to present the children's story? Another, another project we're doing. So we work, as you can see, we work a lot also with uh, p different types of publications. So sometimes it's uh, like um, zines. Sometimes also it's children's book. So we wrote actually three children's stories, and that's the first one. The second and third one are being illustrated right now. And so, yeah, and uh, yeah, we also did a lot of workshop with the kids about making their own books and but you want to go back to so I can if okay. you go back ah, right. 
So the story is called The Story of a Little Girl and the Sun. And it's um, basically the story of a little girl that lives in a city that is called Solnovorat. And Solnovorat comes from Slavic, that means um, solstice. And, uh, right. yeah. and it's a city where the sun never sets. And all the buildings are built like in a very like vertical way. And at midday, everybody goes out and points the nose to the sun in like, in terms of uh, very high admiration for it. And so this uh, little girl uh, one day is playing with her new toy, so it happens to be a balloon, a round balloon, and she managed to obscure the sun for a few seconds. And it's the first time in her life that she can experience the city without the presence of this sun. So then she grows very curious. So she, of course, she has a rabbit, as you know, we love rabbits. And the rabbit tries to obscure the sun, but it is, doesn't work. And the, somebody from the city comes and uh, is very shocked that she wants to do something against the, this like big symbol that is the sun. And so she, yeah, she speaks to the rabbit, and the rabbit has this fantastic idea that there's like a very big stone on top of a mountain. So they go together to a mountain, and it ends up to be the, actually the moon. And the stone starts to speak. So the moon tells her the story that once upon a time, in the city of Solnovorot, the sky was divided between uh, the sun and the moon. And one day, the sun wanted to take over and decided that he never wanted to go down. And since then, he has been shining and overpowering everything. So the little girl decides to go and talk to the sun and ask the sun if he would like to go down for the first time and leave the place to, for the moon. And the sun agrees. And then it's the first time for since a while that, it's the, that the sun sets and it's night over Solnovorot. And that's it. Voila. Voila. <laughs> that's the end. Mm -hmm.